coming up on this episode of Photography Online. We get the gin and the vodka out. We show you a few new filters on the market. And we explain why you probably don't want to shoot at f22. Welcome to part one of our August 2021 show, which is commercial free, so there'll be nothing to ruin the flow for you. And so without delay, let's get things underway. All of the Photography Online team members are working professionals, believe it or not, and occasionally we record them at work doing what they do. This time we're following Marcus on one of his recent jobs. I've been making a living from photography for almost 20 years now, and for me, the secret to ensuring that I stay infused and inspired, both essential ingredients in any creative process, is variety in what I do. One day I could be shooting promotional images for one of the world's biggest airlines, and the next, maybe just a local self-catering property, or standing on a clifftop with a workshop customer, for example. Variety is the key, and I will often turn down work if I feel it's not right for me. Now, one particular assignment came my way recently, which could be considered to be the ideal job for many photographers. Now, don't worry, I haven't suddenly hit the bottle during lockdown. These are all products from Isle of Skye distillers who make Misty Isle gin and vodka and will soon start production of single malt whiskey too. They wanted marketing images of all their existing products taken in a variety of Isle of Skye landscapes. But better than that, there was no brief. Now, Usually with this type of assignment, the client will give the photographer parameters within which to work in, and although this can be helpful, it can also sometimes be a little restrictive. So when the boss at Isle of Sky Distillers said, you're the expert, you just do whatever you want, I knew that this was gonna be the ideal job for me. To give you an insight into my thought process and the considerations I need to make, I thought I would invite you along on a couple of the shoots. So this scene here is gonna be ideal for one of the product shots for Misty Isle Gin. And I've got a lovely rock here in the foreground, which is perfect to place the product on. So I've got a few different uh, products here. We've got vodka, we've got gin, but this is the one that I'm most interested in here because you see it's got green packaging on it and obviously this environment is very green so the two will go very well together so uh, just gonna position that on there roughly at the moment I'm using the 5d SR because the client wants the ability to print these potentially very big so want as much detail as possible um, so that's why I'm using this camera I'm using a 50 millimeter lens, well, for two reasons. Number one, because that's the right focal length for the waterfall from this distance. Um, and number two, this is a f1.4 lens, which is going to allow me to control the depth of field a lot more uh, freely than if I was going to use, say, an f4 lens. This is all about getting the balance of the product, the right size, in comparison to the surroundings. So all I'm going to do is I'm going to work out my distance so that the product feels like it's nicely balanced with the background and that is it's about there so there the product's quite quite dominant in the frame but yet it's got plenty of room to breathe so the camera wants to be exactly there so I need to lower the tripod a little bit. That's looking pretty good there. So the next thing I need to do is focus manually, of course. So that's absolutely pin sharp. So the other thing I need is a polarizer because that's gonna not only help with the surroundings, but also help with the shine off the bottle. 
because obviously it's a very shiny product. So I want to reduce that as much as I can. Okay, so this polarizer is also a neutral density. So that's now giving me half a second, which is pretty much gonna give me the desired effect on the water in the background. Obviously the product isn't moving, so no need to worry about that. So everything's looking pretty good there. So now all I need to do is take the shot. So upon reviewing the image on the back of the camera, uh, it just needs a little bit of kick with some light. Now, rather than do that at the editing stage, it's much easier to do it at the capture stage. So can you see the difference that that's making on the bottle? So what I'm going to do now, make sure I'm out of shot. Now it's just a case of rotating the product and putting different bottles here and keeping everything else the same. Welcome to the world famous Quarang. And it's very, very early in the morning. It's the bad thing about summer here. It's four o'clock in the morning and this is the ideal conditions for misty isle gin because the last thing we'd want is clear blue skies and sunshine. So got the product positioned again. Um, background speaks for itself. Um, so it's just a case of focusing on the product now and then rotating a few different bottles. So let's give this first one a go. One of the key decisions I've got here is deciding which aperture to use. Um, obviously, focusing on the product, um, but then I want the background to be soft but recognizable. So I'm shooting this uh, at f2.8 because that's giving me the right kind of image on the back of the camera. But just for safety, I'm gonna also shoot it at f4 and f5.6. And f5.6, looks way too sharp on here, but when it's big, if the client wants to blow this up really big, then that sharpness is really gonna fall off because it's not sharp, it just looks sharp on the back of the camera. And the bigger the image, the less sharp it'll look. So just so I've got alternatives, I'm gonna shoot that, but I'm not gonna shoot the same for every single product. I'm just gonna do it for one product, and then I'll shoot all the other products at uh, f2.8. Um, and then if it turns out that f5.6 is the one, I'll just replace the product in Photoshop um, into the right depth of field, if that makes sense. So one thing I wanted to show you was the whole principle of getting the product the right size. So I'm using a 50 millimeter lens here, which is giving me the right coverage on the background. If I move the camera forwards and backwards from this point, the background doesn't get any bigger or smaller in size because I'm so far away from it. But obviously the product gets much bigger in size. So I'm just going to use this uh, small camera here just to show you. So this is uh, that's roughly where I've got this camera here. So if I wanted the product a bit bigger in frame without the background getting bigger, I just move it closer to the product and you can see that the product is now much bigger in frame compared to the background. So this is a, a wider angle lens than the one I'm using on the camera. But if I was shooting it on this lens, I'd have the product about there because back here, the product's too small in the landscape there. It's kind of, it's not getting lost, but it's just not big enough. You can't read the text properly and there's just too much breathing space around it. So move in a little bit and just somewhere around there. And there we've got a nice balance of the product is very obvious in the shot. Uh, we've got enough room around the outside to put text and everything. So that's the principle of just getting the background and the foreground 
balance correctly. You can see how that's getting bigger and smaller. So lots of people think that the focal length changes perspective. And as we've seen a couple of shows ago, it doesn't. It's your distance from the subject that changes that. Okay, so that's all looking good in terms of position and everything. I like the composition, but the bottle's lacking a little bit of oomph. So get the reflector on it again, and even though there's no sun, the reflector will just bring it to life a little bit more. So it's just giving it an extra half a stop of light there. It's probably only going to make a subtle difference, but it will be a big difference. Let's have a look. It's not even a subtle difference, it's quite a major difference. So major, I'm just going to back it off a little bit in case it looks a bit contrived. Yeah, that's a wrap. That assignment is an open one, so basically Marcus just keeps going until they beg him to stop. And with a Christmas and a Halloween version to shoot, clearly this is a multi-season job, which is going to take him a while. If you're interested in any Isle of Sky Distillers products, then there's a link in the description below. So if you watched last month's show, you would have seen our darkroom printing special with Robin Bell. So many of you got in touch to say how much you enjoyed it that we've now released the full length 30 minute interview with Robin over on our sister channel MC2 Photography. So if you enjoyed the edited version that you saw here, then I can highly recommend watching the full version. And again, there's a link down below. Now, if you are a regular viewer, then you've probably seen us doing features about lens filters before. However, since we did our last one, there have been a few new and exciting products to the market. So we thought we'd show you some of the more innovative ones which have caught our eye. This here is the Double Grad, a new innovation from Case Filters. But what does it do and why would you want one? To put it simply, the double grad does exactly what it says on the tin. It's a single piece of glass which has two different graduations on opposite ends. This gives three distinct advantages over regular graduated filters. The first of these is a reduction in the amount of physical filters or glass that you need to carry in your bag, as one of these does the task of two normal filters. This means that the double grad not only saves you half the weight, but also half the space in your bag. Secondly, there's the economical benefit in that the double grad is far more cost effective than buying two individual filters. So this means that you can buy the same amount of filters for less money or spend the same amount of money and get even more filters. Either way, it's a bonus. And finally, and this one's my favorite, the double grad makes it so easy to choose and compare which filter is right for your scene. With some scenes, it may be obvious as to which type of grad is needed. For example, if you're shooting a seascape, then a hard grad will often be the best choice. But sometimes in a landscape scene, it's not obvious which type of grad will give the best result. When using traditional grads, you would typically insert the first one to see how it suited the scene, maybe take a test shot. You would then remove that and insert another one to compare which one was best suited for the scene in front of you. Now, that's a lengthy process, and if the light is fleeting, there's every chance that you might miss the shot. The double grad reduces that workflow because it allows you to compare two different grads simply by inverting the filter holder. So one side would be soft filter, the other side would be a hard filter, and you can instantly see which one is best suited for the scene. Easy, huh? And of course, they're made from the usual toughened glass, which can pretty much handle anything you can throw at it. Or in this case, anything you can throw it at. Initially, there'll be two variations of the double grad. The first one being a three-stop hard with a three-stop soft on the opposite side, and the second one being a three-stop reverse with a three-stop medium on the opposite side. But there may be more variations released in the future, so watch this space.
you'll know if you've ever used a lens like this or a big telephoto like this that it's quite a pain to use filters. But if you've got a mirrorless camera like this, then Case have got a solution, which is a clip-in filter which clips in front of the sensor. Now these are available for Canon, Nikon, Sony and Fuji, but only as a neutral density filter or a nighttime astro filter. The concept is simple, just place the filter between the camera's sensor and the lens and bingo. They seem to be held in place by some kind of magical force until you want to take them out, in which case they just pull out. Or you can use a supplied suction tool if you have big sausage fingers which don't fit well into small places. Now they're not available as a circular polarizer or as a grad because they just clip into place and you can't adjust the position. These are a great little solution if you do use more awkwardly sized lenses. And finally we have the new Revel Ring filter system from HMY which has a variable ND and circular polarizer built in but its unique feature is the way that it attaches to the lens and you don't need any filter adapters so all you do is you twist the, the back of the, the filter system and it just simply attaches to the lens like so. So with this system we have two handles, the front one controls the variable ND which goes from one stop through to six stop and behind that we have the second handle which then controls the polarisation. But the main advantage with this system is how easy it is to remove and then subsequently put it onto different lenses which have different thread sizes. This eliminates the need to carry around different adapter rings which in turn saves time and also space in your bag. The river ring is available now, however due to high demand you may find that there is a backlog in trying to get your hands on one. If any of those filters are of interest to you, I've put links to all of them in the usual place. Now, last month, we gave you a chance, well, 250 chances to be precise, to get your hands on one of these Photography Online limited edition lens cloths made by Spuds. A big thanks to everyone that took part and shared our show, and naturally, we had far more entries than we have prizes, but if you enter, then you definitely have a decent chance of winning. Now, obviously, I'm not gonna read out 250 names here, so if you want to see if you were one of the lucky ones chosen at random, then there's a link in the description below for you to see all the winners' names. Alternatively, you can just wait and see if one of these drops through your letterbox in the next couple of weeks. And if you do want one, but weren't lucky enough to win, then they are now available in our online shop, along with photography online t-shirts, hats, and so much more. So check that out when you have a chance. There's a link again down below, or just search for MC2 Photography Shop. So a couple of months ago, we gave you our top tips on how to take your best holiday and travel photos Hopefully, many of you will have either been or will soon be going on your travels. So if you'd like us to feature any of your travel images on our forthcoming surgery, then send them in via the relevant link below. All right, well, now it's time to brush up on our camera skills. Whether you are shooting on a zoom lens or a prime lens, most lenses offer the option to control the size of the aperture. As well as controlling the amount of light coming through the lens, adjusting the size of the aperture also allows how much of our scene will appear in focus, an area known as depth of field. The most useful of the three influences to depth of field is aperture. Basically, the smaller the aperture, the more depth of field you will appear to get. Now, all lenses have their own range of aperture values, with some lenses going down to as small as f90. But if you use a full frame or a crop censored camera, the most common minimum value of most lenses will be f22 or thereabouts. If the smaller the aperture, the more depth of field we get, then it is understandable why many photographers believe that if they shoot everything at f22, they will get sharper photos, because more of the scene will appear to be in focus. Although that makes logical sense, it is naturally true, and shooting at f22, or whatever your minimum aperture of the lens is, will actually result in less sharpness and detail in your photos. This is because of something called diffraction, where light rays which come into contact with the aperture blades get scattered in an unorderly manner. We can visualize this by doing the same with water. 
When water passes through the centre of a hole, it continues in an orderly manner. But as soon as it comes in contact with the edge of the hole, it scatters and becomes chaotic. Now regardless of how big the aperture is, there is some light which will always come into contact with the aperture blades. However, at larger apertures, a higher percentage of the light passes through the hole unimpeded. But as we reduce the aperture size, less and less light is allowed to pass through without coming into contact with the aperture blades. The result is that a high percentage of the light passing through the lens gets scattered and this causes a loss of sharpness on the sensor and therefore in the final image. This scattering of light is known as diffraction and is not something you really want much of in your photos. If you have a lens with a minimum aperture value of f22, then there is a reason why the manufacturer didn't allow the scale to go smaller than this. And this is because they saw diffraction starting to affect the image. There's no physical reason why your lens couldn't go down to f45 or even f64, but if the results are going to be bad, then the manufacturer would rather not allow the lens to do this if it means getting poor reviews or reputation from using such apertures. So if the manufacturer has seen diffraction kicking in at f22 and decided to limit the aperture value to this, then the chances are that you don't want to be using this aperture unless you have very good reason to do so. So although using your smallest aperture will give you more depth of field, the areas of the scene which are in focus will not be as sharp as they would be at say f8 or wider. So in the unlikely event that you are prioritising areas in front of and behind your chosen point of focus, then using your smallest aperture will give you the best results. A far more common situation would be to want your subject pin sharp and the areas in front of and behind this to be as sharp as possible. In this instance, using your smallest aperture would not be good, as it would result in your subject being a little fuzzy due to diffraction. Let's do a couple of tests to show you the difference diffraction makes. Using a 70 to 200 mm f4 lens, let's take this shot at f4. If we zoom into the subject, the area where the lens was focused, we can see that it is pin sharp, but the areas in front of and behind the subject are clearly out of focus. We can close down the aperture to render these areas to appear more in focus, but they will never be truly sharp. If we now take the same shot at f32, the smallest aperture of this lens, we can see that the areas which were originally out of focus now appear to be sharp. But if we zoom in enough, we can see that they are actually not technically sharp. This is all to do with something called circles of confusion, which was explained in our depth of field feature in our May 2020 episode, where my colleague Marcus explained how the three influences of depth of field work. If we now look at our subject, the area that we focused on, we can see that it is not as sharp as it was at F4. This is diffraction at play, with the smaller aperture hole scattering the light as it comes into contact with the aperture blades. If we were able to close this lens down to f45 or further, the image would only get worse, which is why this lens has been limited at f32. So although the title of this feature is why you don't want to shoot at f22, this only applies if your minimum aperture is f22. If like this lens, which goes down to f90, then clearly f22 is well away from the diffraction zone and therefore is no need to avoid it. Basically, avoid using your smallest apertures if you want maximum sharpness on your subject and you want to prioritise this over depth of field. So an f4 lens will probably have a sweet spot of around f8. An f1.4 lens will perform best around f2.8 and an f5.6 lens will perform best around f11 and so on. This is only a generic rule of thumb and all lenses will perform slightly differently. So it's always worth doing some test shots to see where your particular lens works best. Going back to the scene, we shot at f4 and f32, both extremes of this 70 to 200 mm lens. Let's now take the shot at f8 where this lens would typically be performing at its best. We can see that the out of focus areas are still clearly out of focus, as they should be, 
but crucially our subject is now razor sharp. So don't be one of those people who goes around shooting everything at f22 or whatever your smallest aperture is in the hope that this will ensure the sharpest results. It won't. To get the maximum sharpness on your subject, try shooting around two stops smaller than your largest aperture. If you need to increase your depth of field, use your own judgment to work out what the best settings will be. There are no secret formulas here, as it totally depends on the scene and your focal length. Just remember that using your smallest aperture on your lens might give you the maximum depth of field, but it won't give you your sharpest results. If you find our Essential Camera Skills series useful, then I can highly recommend this, our 68-page Series 1 manual, which covers everything that we featured last year, plus a few bonus tips too. We're currently hard at work creating Series 2, which will feature everything we've covered this year, including the focal length explanation, which many of you said was a penny-dropping moment. Series 2 will be available towards the end of this year, so keep watching the show, and we'll announce when they're ready to ship. We also make these kind of announcements on our channel's community area, which you can check out at any time. Okay, well that's it for part one of this month's show, but do join me for part two in just a couple of weeks when we'll be showing you how to use a tripod properly. Apparently many people do it wrong, so you don't want to be one of those. Plus, we'll be tagging along on a one-to-one -one photo workshop here on the Isle of Skye to give you an insight into what this involves, and we'll be seeing what three very different budgets can buy and how this may influence the results that you get. Basically, just be here in two weeks' time. Please give us a thumbs up if you've enjoyed the show, and don't forget to spread the word by telling your friends or family who are interested in photography all about us. See you soon, but until then, you know the drill. Take good care, but most of all, take good photos. Tools.